Thank you for joining today's webinar titled Reopening Your Business and the Use of Face Masks. My name is Paul Medeiros, and I'm an executive within the Food Consulting Group at NSF International. Today's webinar is part of NSF's Reopen and Stay Open program, where we're helping customers from around the globe with their plans to reopen in the face of COVID-19. In the past few weeks, NSF has been fielding questions from various industry executives on how to reopen their businesses while protecting their employees and customers. We've also been busy delivering consulting services to companies, assisting them to develop robust yet workable reopening plans and protocols. We have been developing a suite of webinars, training, and implement implementation tools, as well as an app, all designed to demystify the reopening process and to reassure employees and customers that every step is being taken to protect their safety. Today's webinar will be run by Kim Troutman. Kim is a vice president in NSF's Health Sciences Department. She has over 30 years of experience. Kim worked at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for 24 years and continues to work with regulatory agencies around the globe. She has a demonstrated history of working collaboratively with industry, regulators, and patient groups for the betterment of public health. I've seen Kim in action with our clients and can attest to the value her experience, insight, and approachability bring. Kim is an expert in global medical device regulations and has written and harmonized the current U.S. FDA quality system regulation and was on the international authoring group of ISO 13485 since inception. Kim has a master's degree in biomedical engineering. Now over to Kim. Thank you very much, Paul, for that introduction. And welcome everyone to our webinar on reopening your business and the use of face masks. Today, we're gonna to go through some of the FDA requirements, some of the requirements and standards, um, and discuss the, the filtration and the breathability such that you can be educated consumers and users, as well as as you prepare your businesses, whether that be a clinician's, a doctor's office, or a restaurant worker, or a retail worker, such that you can have the information that you need to keep your workers as safe as possible, comfortable as possible um, in this environment of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as Paul mentioned, uh, my name is Kim Troutman and I'm the Executive Vice President for Medical Device International Services at NSF International. Uh, I have 30 years in the industry and I'm very happy to share some of my knowledge with you here today. So let's start off with looking at some of the regulatory requirements that we have. In the United States, medical device regulations are promulgated and governed by the US Food and Drug Administration. Uh, for any masks that are considered to be medical devices, uh, FDA regulates these devices, and they're there again to protect, uh, to ensure that, that patients have safe and effective devices. Face masks and respirators are regulated by FDA when they meet the definition of device. And generally that is face masks which fall within the definition when there's any type of intended medical purpose to include any type of use by healthcare or emergency care users. Face masks that are not intended for medical purposes are not medical devices and therefore not regulated by the FDA. However, we do have some other issues to consider, even if they're not regulated by the FDA. But first, we all know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been a whole lot of issues with regulated products. One of, the, uh, one of the means or avenues that FDA has gone about in trying to bring products to the market in volumes that are necessary during emergency use is through a pathway called the emergency use authorization. This is not a full marketing requirement or a market entry requirement. It does not go through the FDA typical, what's called a 510K clearance process or approval process. This emergency use authorization lists companies that do submit certain limited information to the agency. Between March and April, and we'll look at this in, in a few minutes, some of the history, FDA has been listing authorized manufacturers of masks. And in this list, they have the, the, the company's name as well as the type of masks. 
Here recently on May 7, something that is greatly going to affect the availability of any type of mask uh, for people that are using it to open retail or any type of restaurants, or even for clinicians and hospitals, FDA has taken a significant action on May 7th. And I wanna talk about that here for a second. So, so first of all, this emergency use authorization process started in early March, but the first time that FDA issued an authorization list for masks was in early April. At the time, this list included 74 manufacturers on April 24th, and when, on April 24th when it lists, it still had 15 different models of N95, and we'll go over the definition of what that is in, in a few minutes. Um, one that was made by 3M in China, plus a number of other models of 13 other Chinese companies, as well as other uh, companies that are from Brazil, Australia, Europe, Korea, Mexico, all over. So at the end of, of March, the, the list had been started. By middle of March, we had 74 manufacturers who had their masks on this emergency use authorization list. However, as part of the emergency use process, um, there was pressure because there was still a lot of shortages, especially given the shortage of masks and respirators for New York City, San Francisco, and some of the other major cities that were having you know, significant outbreaks at that time. There was quite a bit of pressure on the agency and on, on CDC to make more masks available. So one of the things that the FDA did as part of the emergency use process was they said that if a mask had not been tested and approved by NIOSH, NIOSH being the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, um, because they are the ones that really are the, the ones that certify masks for occupational health. So if you go into a Home Depot or to a Lowe's and you can look in the painting section and some of the other section, oftentimes before these pandemic areas, you can get N95 masks for occupational health and safety. And NIOSH, which is a division of the Center for Disease Controls, tests these masks to ensure that 95% of the particulate is filtered out. But as part of the FDA emergency use process, they said if you do not have that NIOSH certification, that you can go ahead and still make an application to be put on the emergency use if you have other third-party verification and testing. Well, as we said, you know, FDA issued a new longer list after that initial March, end of March list on April 7th, and they really started to start fielding a lot more questions and complaints about this new expanded list. And again, this was all in, in the media. Uh, this particular article was from Mass, Mass Medic and Mass Devices, but it was in the Washington uh, Journal. It, it was all over the media. And so as NIOSH started to, to get involved in assessing these respirators that were already on the FDA's emergency use authorization, they started to find that about 60% of them failed the rate of filtration that was being claimed. So we really had more than 50 of these respirators that, uh, that really were not purporting to meet the requirements that they had, and seven of them completely failed the 95% the filtration requirement. So as a result of that, on May 7th, the 60-some manufacturers, mostly from China, their products and their product are no longer allowed to come into the, F, into the U.S. per FDA's requirements for any type of use for medical purposes. Now, if you're a hospital or a clinician's office, that's significant because you want to make sure that the masks you're getting are medical grade. Again, because you, and we'll go through the different levels of mask here later, but you want to make sure that these masks are protecting your healthcare workers from the workers actually contracting the disease. Um, so one note for the majority of us, however, though, is any of these masks that have failed the NIOSH testing can now be relabeled as just general face masks. So I wanted to call this to your attention because a lot of the masks that failed the NIOSH testing, failed the filtration rates, and, and some of them failed in very, very large margins, they still are allowed to come to the market as general face masks for companies if they would like to purchase them for reopening their business. 
but I want you to be educated consumers, which is why I am highlighting this fact and this new action that just literally happened on May 7th. So we've talked already a little bit about NIOSH. Let's go back for a second and, and understand the, the role of NIOSH. NIOSH, or the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, is not typically considered to be a, you know, a regulatory agency. They are a federal agency. They conduct a lot of research. They make recommendations. They produce standards. And they do product testing. In this area of mass, however, the NIOSH standard is something that has been picked up and put into safety and health regulations or for the US OSHA regulations, and hence why it de facto has some other regulatory jurisdiction outside of even FDA, but for general purposes for, for safe workplace safety and health regulations. So as I mentioned earlier, N comes from the NIOSH, and 95 really is coming from the fact that it's going to filter out 95% of the airborne particulates. As a side note that these are particulate that are not resistant to oil. Whenever there's particulates in oil, there's different uh, material filtration capacities and so forth. Uh, for those of you that might be thinking of restaurant workers that might be dealing with fryers and other type of oil, it's not meant for the occasional oil splattering. This, these other categories really have to do with workers that are traditionally in the gas and oil industry that have uh, a much larger volume and then there's additional requirements for that. So for the majority of us, we may have seen these N95 masks, like I said, at a Lowe's or a Home Depot, um, because they, they are available for, for occupational safety and health. Now, we talked about NIOSH, and that's a US standard. There are many other standard organizations in different countries. And you, if you just Google, you can see some of the different standards from other countries. Again, one of the most popular ones being uh, the Chinese standard is known as KN95. Uh, again, that's for 95% of the particulates being filtered out. Uh, for Europe, they have an EN, which is a European norm, 149. And from this slide, you can see the whole host of different national standards. This is one area that unfortunately that there isn't a lot of global harmonization or an ISO international standard that has harmonized these standards. Um, so while this list was produced by you know, the government to show comparison, uh, it, it also is going to highlight for you that there are some differences. So just because you see something on the internet or suppliers providing something and they say they meet EN, uh, 149 standard or the Chinese uh, standard and they've got certification to make it a KN95 mask, that doesn't mean that they're equal to the NIOSH 95 mask, but that they are comparable. And we will go into that here in, in a few seconds. When we take a look at these different standards, you can see, again, because there's not been international harmonization, that there's slight differences in the filtration performance. Again, uh, NIOSH 95 filters out um, more greater than or equal to at least 95% of the particulates. The European standard requires 94%. Uh, the Chinese KN95 mass is greater than or equal to 95, but you can see that. You can see they've been tested with different test agents. Um, they have different flow uh, rates. And again, we'll talk about breathability and flow rates. So there's slight differences there. there. There's slight differences in intake leakage as well as inhalation resistance. If we go through and, and continue this list, this comparison list, you can see that there's exhalation pressures and differences in flow rates, um, pore supplied and carbon dioxide clearance requirements. So again, these aren't identical standards, but they are comparable or comparable. And for purposes of this pandemic, almost all the regulatory jurisdictions around the world have basically been saying that if you meet any of these country specific requirements for these standards, that at least you have some of the assurances of filtering out greater than or equal to 94, 95% of the particulates. But it's not just the amount of particulates. So I want to stop here and really take you know, a second to show you visually 
some comparisons from particulate sizes. So if you look at you know, the largest one, which is a 10 micron, and we look at a blood cell at seven micron, um, those are going to be pretty easily filtered out, even by the do-it-yourself mass that we'll talk about at the end of the presentation here. Um, so let's take a look at some of those smaller molecules that we have on the screen. Let's take a look at the 2.5 micron, um, but then let's go down and look at bacteria. Bacteria is typically around the 0.5 micron. The coronavirus, the Ebola virus, and some of the other known viruses are much closer to 0.1. And some mass, some of the really high medical grade mass are meant to filter pro, uh, particulates at the 0.0007. And we'll talk about that because we're gonna talk about the fact that the better the filtration with the smaller the particulate uh, size, the breathability becomes much more difficult. So there is a give and take and, and a little bit of a balance that has to be understood here. So I'm gonna show this slide a couple times just to, to occasionally bring us back and, and remember where we are. But particularly, you know, the standards and some of the things that we're gonna talk about today, talk about point, excuse me, yeah, 3.0. So you can see 3.0 is somewhere between the size of a red blood cell and that 2.5 particulate. And we're gonna talk about point three microns, which is really something that where bacteria could be filtered out, but might not even filter out something as small as the coronavirus or Ebola. So again, we will come back to this slide occasionally. So in addition to the FDA, in addition to NIOSH standards, we also have some standards that have been put forth by the American Society for Testing and Materials, known as ASTM. And ASTM puts together standards and helps us to really pull in some additional data. Uh, it talks about the fluid resistance. Um, very important for this topic, it talks about bacterial filtration efficiencies. Again, this is the percentage of aerosol particulates filtered at a size of three microns. So we'll go back to that slide and, you know, and look at, it can definitely take out blood, but it's not going to take out the bacteria and the viruses. Um, hence why there's another uh, efficiency filtration, which is the submicron. Uh, the PFE is the percentage of submicrons particulates that filtered at the 0 0.1. And again, this is much closer to what we need if you're going to truly say that a, any type of mask would filter out the, 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 the coronaviruses or, or the COVID-19 virus. In addition, the ASTM standards get into that pressure differential to help measure that breathability aspect, as well as flame spread or flame retardant. Again, because medical masks that are being used in surgical suites often are in very dry temperature controlled rooms, um, but also more importantly, it is surrounded by pure oxygen canisters, it's surrounded by cauterization machines and other things that can be flammable. So for, for masks that are used in hospitals, surgical suites, and so forth, uh, having some flame retardant is, is very important as well. So the AMS, ASTM standards include flame resistance or flame spread. So again, just to show you this, we're going to talk a lot about that 3 micron area and that 0.3 micron or the 0.1 micron. So just so that you can kind of get an idea of where we are on the scale of particulates as we spoke here a few seconds ago. So for most of us that are working in some way, shape or form to get back to normal, if we remember what normal was, um, and open up our retail or our businesses, our restaurants, um, even you know clinics and, and other doctor's offices, uh, it, it's very important to understand, really truly understand these days, which mask is more efficient and for what purpose. So I, I wanna give credit, you'll, you'll see these slides have references where, where I drew some of this information from, um, but some very good information. If we look at that highest level of really trying to have a mask, a respirator mask, um, which N95 you know, is very, very comparable to, uh, you really have to consider the, the breathability. But let's take a look at that high level of respirator mask. 
if we look at the NIOSH standards as well as the Chinese standards, again, you can see that for these, um, it's going to filter out the 0.3 microns greater than 95% of the time. Now remember, viruses are in the submicron range, so they're closer to the 0.1. So even with NIOSH requirements and even the, the KN Chinese standard, we're still talking about 0.3 microns at 95%. Um, and there are other grades of 99 and, and close to 100%. Again, uh, that really affects breathability. We can compare that to the European standard. Now the European standard, as you notice from this slide, only filters out 80% of that 0.3 microns at that, uh, at that range comparable to the N95. So you're gonna see some slight differences. Um, again, depending on what your purposes are, if you're a hospital and you're a supply unit for a hospital or any type of critical care unit, this is gonna be important for you as we move out of the emergency use and clinical setting, we'll show you some of those levels as well. Again, if we even look at surgical masks and, and you know, what's considered to be a surgical mask, which is there's different levels, and we look at those ASTM requirements, and we look at the Chinese and the European requirements all side by side here, you can see that at that uh, three micron, you know, the Chinese have 95% as claimed, they're, they're going to filter out uh, the 0.3 microns, which is fine for blood, not for bacteria or viruses. The ASTM standards have different levels, and we will talk about the, the, the different levels and actually four levels of ASTM standards here in a second. But you can see that if we look at the 0.1 microns where that virus size is about, the ASTM standard requires that 0.1 microns be filtered out greater than 95% of the time, where the Chinese standard as listed only requires that it be greater than 30% of the time. And if we look at the European standard, you'll see that they don't have any requirements for the 0.1 microns. They only have it for a 0.3 microns. So again, these standards are similar, comparable, but definitely not equal. If we go down one more, more step, if you will, to single-use face masks, these are the ones that are typically used you know, day in and day out. Um, again, if you look at the, the Chinese standard, it, it still has a you know, great 95% uh, rate of filtering the, the three micron out, but it has zero of, of the 0.1 virus size microns that it's expected to filter out. So really, it goes down to choosing the right mask, whether you're a hospital, whether you're an emergency use, firefighter, you know, police department, retailer, uh, food establishment, whatever. It really comes down to choosing the right mask. And you have to consider the mask design, you have to consider the fit, you have to consider the filtration, and then we'll also talk about breathability. So you wanna match the protection levels that are needed um, for the risk level of, of your workers. Now, again, if we still stay in that medical setting and we look at the, the ASTM, I said there was four levels, uh, that maximum filtration level of level four, really now gets into that high fluid resistance, the filtration rate, the breathability, and the flame spread. So these are the masks that we talked about that would be more usable in the operating suite where you've got you know, oxygen tanks and cauterizing machines and so forth. And, and it gives you a list of the different requirements per the ASTM standards. All right, if we look, again, we're going down in levels, therefore we're going down in filtration capabilities. Um, we, we see very, very comparable, you know, very similar fluid resistance, uh, very, very high filtration efficiency still, but a bit different in breathability, a little bit easier on the breathability and still have some class one, which is the flame spread. So these are ideal for procedures in clinical settings where there can be heavy or moderate uh, aerosol. So somebody working uh, with the patients in, you know, depending on what level of care, whether that be an emergency worker, a firefighter, a policeman, or nurses that are helping to triage and so forth. These are still appropriate for, for those medical purposes. 
Once we now start getting down into the, the level two, we still can have medical purposes because you can see we still have 98% filtration rate of that 0.1 micron. We have a bit better breathability. We still have some flame retardants. Um, fluid resistant is a little less. So if, if you are sanding over a bed or a patient very, very close while you're taking temperature or any type of telemetry, um, that, that fluid resistance is a little bit less. Again, these are ideal for a little bit uh, more clinical settings or settings where there's less exposure to the amount of spray, sneezing, coughing that, that might go on. When we look at level one, again, the fluid resistance goes down, uh, the breathability goes up, but we still have a fair amount of protection for medical purposes. And again, these are ideal for procedures where there's very, very little chance or low amounts of coughing, sneezing, and aerosols being produced in, in the air. So now we start getting into some other type of what we call low performance. These are getting into the areas where the NIOSH uh, occupational safety uh, mask that you can see and buy at Lowe's and Home Depot are. Um, they are really, they're, they're kind of molded, so you've got a nice tight fit, but they are only really meant to be physical barriers. There's you know little or no level of performance that may be established. And one of the key indicators that we'll talk about is all those other masks that we talked about had strapping mechanisms that really made the fit much closer. Now into these low performance, you also start seeing what we call the ear loop or the elastic around the ear. And uh, as of yesterday, FDA and CDC said that with the amount of studying that they've done, that the ear loops, they still haven't found a design with ear loops or the ear straps uh, that really fit appropriately to ensure for medical purposes, the protection for healthcare or emergency workers. And again, we'll, we'll show you why the ear straps allow a little bit more flex and comfort here on the side and down here at the chin, but because of that, it opens up for aerosol ingress uh, in, inside the mask. Uh, so we do, you know, we have a, a lot of minimum performance masks. They call them tissue masks. Now they're not face, nose tissues, but, but they are a much lighter material and we'll talk about different materials and, and their filtration capabilities. Uh, so, but again, something is better than nothing. Uh, so these are ideal just as physical barriers for, for the patient coming in during exams, short exposures, dry environment. You see that there's, you know, no level of uh, any type of flame resistant or spread or anything else. And last but not least, still within the medical grade arena, we have full length face shields. And these are optically clear, uh, hopefully distortion free. I've seen some do it yourself face shields where people actually took the old acetates for those of you that remember acetate on the screens uh, when we used to use that for presentations or even the, the clear paper covers and they've made some makeshift face shields, but ideally it's going to be a, a little bit more structure, a little bit harder plastic, uh, oftentimes a foam headband to keep the shield away from the, the mouth so you don't fog it up, um, elastic or something to keep it uh, tightly secured. Uh, sometimes there may be anti-fog treatment on the inside or outside with different uh, size options. And what this is for is even with the N95, N99, the medical grade surgical mask, uh, if you have a very contagious person, face shields is an, on top of the mask is another way to really try to reduce the exposure of the worker actually contracting the disease. Um, so, so many people have been making and, and selling face shields as well. Uh, I'm gonna stop and, and kind of shift gears a little bit because uh, even though the hospitals, the clinicians are all still scrambling a bit to, to have a, the right volume. And as I mentioned, as of May 7th, with the FDA cutting the number of emergency use uh, companies that are listed on that emergency use authorization list and taking 60 some companies off that list, um, mostly from China, it really comes down to, you know, what are some of the other alternatives? 
again, whether you are a retailer, a restaurant owner, or just anybody get, trying to get their workers back to business, uh, I would tell you that some of the sewn do-it-yourself masks are as good. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to, to go and, and look to buy things. And we'll talk a little bit about whether you want them to be disposable versus reusable. Uh, many of the uh, do-it-yourself masks made out of cloth can be reusable. The CDC says that if you wash, wash the masks in, in warm to hot water as well as dry them in heat, that it does kill the virus and therefore cloth reusable masks actually can be reusable without any of the vaporized hydrogen peroxide or any other type of sterilization methods in between. So let's talk about some of the benefits, whether you have workers actually make their own or whether you contract with a garment manufacturer or somebody that has sewing capabilities uh, to, to make masks available for your workers. Let's talk about this. And, and I got a lot of this information off of a, of a great website and I wanna give credit where credit's due. And we're gonna walk through some of the studies and testing that he's done. And I've checked it and, and there's been a lot of other sources that collaborate you know, a lot of the data, but, but this particular site did a really nice job of pulling a whole bunch of things together. And they tested a whole different variety of materials for, for different purposes. So again, I just want to show you the slide again on the particulate side. So we remind ourselves that, you know, we're, we're really talking about when we talk about some of the materials that may be used, just remember what, what type of sizes that we're dealing with. If we're talking about bacteria and viruses, we are talking at 0.1 microns or lower, you know, the 0.5 and the 0.1 uh, versus the, the one or three microns. So let's take a look at, at some of the face uh, mask materials that we can sew in, in our own homes. And, and I will show you here at the end some additional masks that, that we've made and, and so forth. But if you take a look at the 3M N95 occupational safety mask that you can pick up at Lowe's, Home Depot's, et cetera, as well as the, the surgical mask, you see their filtration capabilities great. Um, but the do-it-yourself materials did really well at filtering out 0.1 microns or larger. So 0.1 microns is Ebola. Remember, uh, the COVID is not 1.0, COVID-19 is 0.1. So there, there are some viruses that are larger, um, some that are smaller. Unfortunately, in this particular pandemic, we're dealing with a smaller virus. Um, but even if you look down this list, you can see that such things as ca uh, canvas and denim are, are doing quite well at filtering out 0.1 microns or greater, 93% of the time, 92% of the time. Even beds, bed sheets at 100% cotton with 120 thread count. And again, some, some bed sheets are even higher thread counts of two or 300. Um, you'll also see that there's a lower thread count down in that list of an 80 thread count. So even simply taking bed sheets and using that type of material can give you something along the lines of 90% or on the lower count thread count, you know, 84%, where it can filter out 0.1 micron or greater particulates. Uh, so we go down into some other synthetic material like the, like the nylons and so forth, and we'll talk about the difference between natural fibers and synthetic fibers. And, and you'll see that the synthetic fibers actually do worse. So you can see how even that synthetic one down second from the bottom it is down to the 57% for the 1.0 micron or greater. Now let's take a look at these materials again um, at the 0.3 micron range. This is the range of, of typical bacteria. Again, knowing that the, the COVID virus is 0.1, so even smaller, but even looking at bacterial filtration, you can see that a lot of the do-it-yourself masks still have some decent filtration rates of, you know, 45 up to, you know, 75, well, no, excuse me, 75, uh, the surgical mask, but, but you can get, you can get to some of that 45%, even with some things such as a kitchen towel, all right? So don't, don't disregard the do-it-yourself or don't disregard 
having a garment manufacturer and, and understanding what type of material they want to use, making, making masks for your employees might be just as viable as purchasing disposable or you know, disposable masks. Whoops. Um, so I promised that we would talk very, very briefly about the difference between natural fibers versus synthetic fibers. We talked a little bit about cotton, uh, the, the, the tighter the weave, the, the tighter the thread count, of course, the tighter the weave, the, the better filtration and, and maize that you give. Uh, but also the natural fibers do better because natural fibers have an irregular shape. Um, because of that irregular shape, they act as a better filtering mechanism, whereas synthetic materials typically are, are smoother, more uniform. Um, they allow more particulates to pass through and to escape. So the, irregular, the irregularity of natural fibers, it makes materials with natural fibers higher thread counts to be a much better filtering mechanism. So do-it-yourself masks are meant, this is very, very important as we enter into all of us trying to get back to work in some way, shape, or form. The do-it-yourself mask or the, the common masks that are, are flooding the, the Google or the Amazons or anything else, all those masks that got rejected off of the FDA emergency use authorization list are allowed to be used as just general purpose masks. All the general purpose masks, do-it-yourself masks, they are meant not to protect you from contracting the virus, but they are meant to prevent or to reduce the spread of the environment. They're taking, if you are a non-symptomatic person and many people, many people in this particular virus are showing that they've had it and had shown known symptoms, um, that you might not even know that you had the, the COVID-19 virus. And now as we find out, uh, COVID-19 may have been in the States as early as December. So you may not have even known you had it, people have been asymptomatic, or you may actually have just contracted it and, and not produced any symptoms yet. These masks are all really to prevent you from the potential spread or to reduce uh, the spread of the disease as we all go back into closer quarters into reopening businesses, working with our colleagues you know, in closer proximity. So very, very important slide to remember. So when we talk about all those materials with filtrations, we now also have to think about breathability. Okay, so we are not typically going to be the surgeons that go into the surgical suite for you know, a set hour or, you know, obviously sometimes they're longer, but the surgical suite masks really have difficulties in the respirators. It's much more difficult to breathe because it's tighter weave, uh, the pressure differential, it, it, it takes training, it takes training on how to wear them, how to not manipulate them or put them on properly. Um, we now have to really consider, you know, not only what is good for filtration, um, but breathability because some of the materials that actually may be the best for filtration, if we take, and we had one of the, the pictures of literally a foam uh, breast cup from a, a broth was one of the materials that was tested by, by that one site. And you took that and you put a, a nylon, literally from a women's pantyhose nylon, and put that over top, that actually tested to be the best from a filtration, but you practically suffocate because there, there's not the breathability. And now we're getting into a period in reopening businesses where we want our workers to potentially be wearing these masks four hours, six hours, or eight hours at a time. So we, you know, we need to really consider the breathability of some of these materials. This particular scheme by, by, by the testers, the more star, or excuse me, the more crosses or hash marks means they're, they're more breathable. Again, you will see the ones that did less or did poorer in the filtration actually do better in the breathability. Larger weaves like wool, even though it's natural fibers, um, you know, it's a, a looser weave and larger weaves, they make for better breathability, but you're giving up filtration in order to get the better breathability. Again, as we look at surgical masks and even the do-it-yourself mask of 200% cotton, uh, t-shirt layers, just, just two cotton t-shirt layers, uh, it's still fairly breathable. 
and it, it still has that that approximately 40 45 percent filtration rate so so actually you know pretty good um, as you go to those higher thread counts, as you get into the, the bed sheets that have the 120 bed count or into denim, some of the denim in, in canvas, of course, the thicker the material, the harder the breathability. And of course, the N95 masks used for occupational safety and so forth, um, again, have more difficulty in breathability. So the attention that I really want to draw to you is I want everyone to be educated consumers and purchasers is you really, like we said, you need to know the purpose as to what the masks are going to be used for, who's going to be using them. Are, are you purchasing for, for medical emergency purposes? Are you purchasing for, for no, normal day to day where in longer periods of time? Um, and if you are, you really need to have that balance between filtration and breathability. If people are not comfortable, if people aren't comfortable wearing masks for extended period of times, for a four to six to eight hour shifts, they will not wear the mask consistently and properly and therefore really take out the benefit of the mask altogether. Um, number one, you want the people to not manipulate the mask and, and fuss with the mask as much as possible. Even though, as we said, the purpose is to try to not spread the disease, if people are taking masks on and off, there's the chance of their hand touching the interior of the mask where they're breathing. And again, if they're sick, but um, if they, they've contracted COVID, but don't have symptoms yet, um, they touch the inside of that mask and now touch any other surface, they are now spreading the disease. Uh, again, if masks are put down on surfaces, if they, they put them down on the surfaces, they're basically contaminating any surface that, that they put, put the mask down on. Um, if you have workers where you're going to use reusable masks, uh, again, the best kind are either to have them use one and dispose of it or use it once, go home and wash it. Uh, you know, for, for some of the recommendations for, for medical purposes, I know uh, nurses and hospitals early on were using the medical masks with labeled Ziploc bags, they were putting the masks in, Ziplocking them and, and using them again. But again, the more you manipulate putting masks in and out of any type of Ziploc bags, you touch the material where you've been breathing and now you touch anything else, you can potentially be spreading the virus. Uh, so, you know, again, we'll also talk about the difference between the ear loops versus some of the other tie strings, because if you have a mechanism where they can take a tie string off at the top and let the bottom still be on and hang, that allows, um, and again, we'll, we'll look at some you know, practical examples, that allows the workers to be able to let it still hang from their neck, not have to put it down on another surface. Um, so these are all the kind of things that you want to consider. So if we go back to the do-it-yourself or having, you know, a garment manufacturer and you may need to be picking, you know, what materials some of your reusable masks may be made out of, you know, some of the top five materials still, of course, are the ones that are heavier, higher weave count, higher natural fibers, denim, two bed sheets. Um, again, you, know, you can supplement even having you know, two bed sheets with either a paper towel or coffee filters in the middle of some of the do-it-yourself mask designs and, and so forth. So there are definitely more optimal uh, opportunities. Now I'm going to go and hopefully you can see me. Um, I'm going to go and actually show you some masks that I made at home following the CDC guidelines, following the patterns. And I also wanna show you some different shapes because remember I told you about the fit. The fit was very important. So you may see designs such as this. They're, they're the small little rectangular mask. They've got bifolds that allow for breathability and movement of the mouth, okay? Uh, this particular variety has that ear loop that, that we talked about, because again, a lot of people find that the other type of tie strings in the back may slide, might not be tied, or might not stay tied well. Um, so this is one design. The other option is the fact that you can have it such that it opens up 
And I mentioned the fact that you can put a paper towel or a coffee filter. So this particular, and these, all these little templates and stuff are all over the websites and internet. Um, so you can actually take this, put a paper towel or a coffee filter inside. Of course, you don't wash the paper towel or coffee filter. You take those out and dispose of them. Um, and you can just then plop this in the wash machine on hot, dry it, and, and this is a very, very durable, reusable mask. Now, before I put this one down, I want to highlight both the shape and the earrings. Now, a lot of the patterns out there have a straight cut at the bottom. One of the nifty things is, is this particular one, there's an actual seam at the bottom. And that seam allows for a tighter fit. And I'm gonna put it on, but you won't be able to hear me as well, but I want you to take a look at how it fits the chin. So the tighter to the chin, again, the better because you're keeping fluid in and you're not also allowing potentially some amounts of uh, uh, air, aerosol or airborne in. Uh, we mentioned the fact that the ear loops are not recommended for any type of medical purposes because typically with the ear loops, you have gapping on the side. So while more comfortable, there is more gapping, um, and, and this is either a kind of an on or off. You know, it's kind of difficult to keep it hanging, although you could uh, keep it hanging from one ear. But because the ear loops tend to be loose, uh, they, they, they do have some limitations. Now, from a design perspective, still sticking with the do-it-yourself mask, is another design which is out there, which has a different shape. So this shape is more, you know, for the face. Uh, it does have a nose clip. So taking some, some just simple uh, metal in the shape of pipe cleaners, which again, uh, you can pick up at any arts and crafts store. So this one has, has the pipe cleaner sewn into it. The shape itself allows both for a tighter fit and, and definitely takes away some of the gapping. So if you take a look at this, you're going to see a tighter fit around the nose, a tighter fit around the side, mostly because of the design. So you can have two shoestrings, one shoestring on top and one at the bottom, or you can just use a large shoestring, which you just literally thread. So this is one shoestring that's just threaded from the bottom up on both of these. All right. And in this design, you get a much nicer, tighter fit goes up around the nose. It's amazing how many people that are wearing these type of rectangular masks that I still see them wearing below the nose. Again, uh, the virus is coming in and out of people's noses and mouths equally. So having someone wear the mask properly is so important, which means it has to be comfortable. Allowing workers to wear it below their nose is really defeating the purpose of, of wearing it just as much. Uh, the nasal, uh, passageway is, is allowing the virus out just as much as the mouth. So please, again, proper utilization is, is important. And these, these rectangular masks definitely allow workers to allow that to ease down. Where this design, really, it, it's not, not quite as easy for them to not wear it properly. It is meant to fit, to have the nose piece up here and to fit tighter around. Um, I, I'll put this on and show you. And again, the nice thing about this mask is we talked about the fact that you don't want workers taking the mask off and putting it down uh, on surfaces because that could potentially contaminate the other surfaces. By having this and having the loop or two strings where you keep one tied at the bottom would allow the workers to take this down if they're on break, um, hopefully completely socially distanced while they're doing that to eat and then to put the mask back on when they go up. Um, I'm gonna put this on, won't be able to speak clearly for a few seconds, but I'll show you the tighter fit. This design is also much easier for many people that wear glasses because again, because the nose piece is really fitting it around the nose, the glasses fit over, over top of the nose piece quite easily and it doesn't prevent, or it does prevent uh, some of the fogging that is happening if people are wearing glasses with, with these type of masks. 
again, some advantages are both the shape of the do-it-yourself mask, how you're actually using you know, the straps or, or variety, as well as the fact that you've got the nose piece that's allowing you to have a tighter, to have a tighter fit. Um, again, all kinds of different designs, shapes, you can have, so this is the second design, it's a different material. You can see, you know, we at the Troutman household have been having fun. If you notice, we were, we're a house of engineers. We've got some material that have some fun mathematical equations. You can have fun tie-dye. You can use old t-shirts. You can use bed sheets. Um, again, the, the length on the side can be adjusted if you've got bigger faces. The important thing is even if it comes here is that, is that you've got a tight fit. So at this point, hopefully I've been able to give you some valuable information, giving you a little bit of demonstration of some of the different shapes, materials, uh, ways to wear them. Um, and we're gonna open it up for a few questions before we end the webinar. But don't fear, we will still allow you to continue to have questions in the chat. So hopefully you can go into the chat function um, and in the chat function, you can put your questions. And if I don't get to one of your questions and answer it here right now, we will be providing written answers to the questions and we will provide it to all of our viewers. So let's take a, a few questions uh, since we have a little bit of time. Uh, the first question is, is are there general requirements for food safety? And the answer is that CDC has not re required or said that there was any additional requirement for food workers or food safety than anybody else in the general public. They recommend the same CDC guidelines and that is any of the masks that provide the barrier. Again, remember this is for the workers to prevent you know, spreading the disease, not contracting the disease. So any of our do-it-yourself masks or any of the reusable masks that aren't for medical purposes uh, would be acceptable for food workers as well as any other retailer or any other worker. Another question is, it says, if I wear a mask and others are not wearing one, will I be protected? Um, the answer is unfortunately no, we are all in this together and it really is common courtesy for everyone to be following the CDC guidelines. In fact, it's really quite selfish if people are going out without some sort of mask because you may be the one that is potentially spreading the contagion and you might not even know it. There's so many people that don't have symptoms at all, so many people that have delayed symptoms, so many people, it's, we're starting to find out that people that have contracted it and then gotten better um, still can be symptomatic, can still be carriers for up to two to three weeks afterwards. So really, we all have to be in this together. We have to be courteous. If we don't want to go back into the more draconian lockdown and, and really have to isolate ourselves more, if we want to reopen our businesses to stay viable and, and to get back to normal, we all have to wear at least some level of mask, wear them properly, you know, and be considerate. But we are not necessarily with our mask, if you're not in any of those medical grade FDA uh, authorized lists of masks, we are not really protecting the contamination of our cells. We are not protecting our cells against contaminated, uh, contamination or, or infection. We are truly just trying to prevent us contaminating or infecting somebody else. All right, so we all have to, 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 to be diligent. Therefore, we want to make good decisions on fit and wearability and have people wear them and, and wear them comfortably. And, and the last question that I have time for right now, it says, my company has actually forbidden people to wear N95 masks and respirators because they say that there are, there are requirements for training proper uses of those masks and therefore we are not permitted to use N95 masks and we have to use the more do-it-yourself or other type of general purpose face mask. For someone as myself that has asthma and COPD in shortness of breath, you know, what might the mask, you know, appropriate mask be? Again, this is, this is hard because we have somebody here that is already predispositioned in a higher risk category. Um, it's a bit unfortunate that uh, the, 
the workplace is not allowing N95 masks if, if you're able to actually get your hands on any. Um, but again, I understand that N95 and true respirators do require uh, training, do require proper utilization, and it may be giving people a false sense of, of security if, if it's not being worn appropriately and there is breathability. For, for anybody that does have asthma or any type of predisposition from a breathing lung capacity perspective, again, you really want to consider the fact that, A, number one, you're not preventing, you know, getting the disease, you're really protecting somebody else. So you wanna take that balance of materials that we talked about that provide you know, the, the appropriate filtration rate or at least a good filtration rate um, of the, the, the 1.0 and hopefully some of the 0.3 micron particles that we talked about. And so canvas, the two layer cotton with the higher thread count with natural fibers um, or potentially, and, and there are designs even for this shape for you to make the bi, the bifold uh, where you can actually have you know, a little pocket inside that, that you can put that additional uh, coffee filter or paper towel. Uh, so for anybody with asthma or those type of uh, restricted breathing capabilities, try to find materials that give enough filtration rate, but allow with your conditions for you to be able to breathe in them for the time period that you need, need to. Uh, if, you, if you have to do shifts of four hours or whatever the price you know, prescribed uh, time period is, uh, you might want to play around with different materials to help and assure that you've got comfortable breathing. You don't go into any type of uh, asthma attack or any other type of breathing distress, but at the same time, you're still being courteous and responsible citizens by, by wearing your mask in, in the workplace. So with that, I want to thank you very much. Again, please remember that you can, uh, any of the questions that you add into the chat, we will follow up and answer those questions uh, in writing with you. Uh, please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We have additional webinars that we've done on hand uh, disinfectants and sanitizers. Uh, we've got some additional information on UVC lights and a whole bunch of other uh, information on how to reopen safely in, in this current environment. So with that, I thank you very much. If anybody needs to reach out to me, there's some contact information. And once again, I hope you find this instructive and helpful to be educated consumers and, and buyers and all of us responsible citizens as we go back and enter into our hopefully semi-normal uh, work environment in the coming days. Thank you again very much. Stay healthy and safe. Goodbye now.